I think we have people also in the, uh, the Zoom call. And uh, I would like us uh, to do a little interaction session. Uh, if you are in Slido, you should be able to get into um, the site. Let's see. Hopefully this will work. What institution and department do you work at? Well, this uh, give us a sense of who we are as a, a whole community. I see a lot of people from UAB, but I also see people from other institutions, Georgia Tech, uh, University of Kentucky. This is great. Now I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, and see what is your current job title or role? Pretty exciting to see that um, we got many faculty primary uh, principal investigators, and we're hoping that uh, your labs are also participating and graduate students. We do see about, yeah, good proportion of graduate students coming in. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, I think this is a trivial, so I'm gonna go to this one. So what would you like to accomplish today? Some of us are interested in new tools and networking. Uh, we do have plenty of seats. Uh, for those of you who are participating online, uh, feel free to find um, a gap in your schedule and come and network with other people. Uh, many of you are coming here to learn about a clinical ap application of AI in medicine. We have great sessions coming up see what's going on in the field. This is awesome. All right, I'm not gonna close the poll, so continue uh, to, to enter the information. I would like to show you a little video, if I may, to show you one example, what I felt it's a pretty exciting I can get the network. To this end, a team of researchers from the Jamil Clinic at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Massachusetts General Hospital developed a deep learning algorithm that can predict individual lung cancer risk without clinical or demographic data inputs. 
The algorithm, named Sybil, uses data from a single LDCT scan to predict the likelihood of the development of lung cancer one to six years in the future. Sybil was trained using over 28,000 scans with known lung cancer risk and was programmed to learn from expert annotations of biopsy-confirmed cancers to better reason over the entire LDCT. The team evaluated the performance of Sybil using three independent datasets of LDCT scans of diverse patient cohorts from the National Lung Screening Trial, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. They found that Sybil could forecast short- and long-term lung cancer risk from the LDCT scans accurately for a wide range of patients and on modern scanners. Moreover, it provided relevant information regarding future lung cancer risk in patients. Sybil has the potential to revolutionize lung cancer screening and management, enhance personalized screening, and reduce the overall frequency of biopsies. Combined, these applications can increase cost-effectiveness and may make LDCT-based lung cancer screening feasible even in low-resource settings. Importantly, the preliminary data indicate that Sybil may be a powerful tool for prioritizing patients who are at higher risk of lung cancer, regardless of their smoking history. Further research is warranted to enable Sybil for real-world clinical applications. Well, an uh, example like this can be found everywhere, and I'm simply pulling out a recent uh, publication and uh, featured by ASCO. And in fact, this video was uh, made by American Society of Clinical Oncology. And I simply want to show you that AI is real, AI in medicine is coming, and that you're gonna see more AI in medicine in the research stage and probably in the application in the future. And all of us probably agree that this is a golden age to be in this field. And let me see um, if I can get to the next page. And the age of AI has come. And I just want to bring out one article that I read from last year. And the AI today is very different from machine learning, even going back 10 years ago. The AI today take multimodality data. It actually can use a few labels to learn and uh, it will have many, many parameters. And in the case of large language model could be trillions of parameters and they run on massive computational power. And many, many opportunities uh, you're going to see today include the precision health, uh, digital clinical trials, uh, hospital at home, uh, uh, disease surveillance, digital twins, virtual health doctor, and so on and so forth. And I think of, uh, if you are enthusiastic, and I, want, I would like you to withhold your enthusiasm. I do have a short video, but I don't think I have a time. I would like to play it over the lunchtime and then give you some treat. So without further ado, I would like, yeah, this is a video. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Trey Attaker. Uh, I've known Dr. Triadiker for more than 20 years. Um, he's currently a professor of medicine, bioengineering, and computer science at UCSD. He's a co-director of UCSD's PhD program in bioinformatics and systems biology. He's a director of the NIH Bridge to AI Functional Genomic Program, a uh, national resource uh, for Network Biology Center Director, and many other NIH and NCI Center Directors related to cell map. And he is certainly well-educated, and many of you may not know, but I know uh, I personally attended 
the lecture by Lee Hood, one of the founding father for systems biology with Trey and uh, DNA sequencer inventor. And the Trey was his uh, PhD student. And I believe that Trey went to MIT Whitehead uh, for his postdoc. He's an editorial on the editorial board of so many high impact journals, including Cell Nature. And most impressively, he was achieving all of these accomplishments when he was really young. He was decorated as MIT innovators uh, 35 under 35 and many accomplishment, um, just uh, praised by International Society of Computational Biology. But I would like to point it out that most of you, even if you don't know his many impressive accomplishment, you actually use his software tool and Cytoscape. Um, and one of the things that, um, that uh, I think uh, really impressed me was even before I knew uh, Trey or Cytoscape, I read his uh, uh, science publication where he co-authors with Lee Hood that talk about how network could actually help uncover protein function in a, in a landmark uh, science paper. And I actually, that's how I got to uh, know his work and uh, watch his career trajectory just exploded. He's one of the person that keep on innovating, keep on finding new pathways to spearhead our field. So without further ado, a tray. Speak into this. Thanks, Jake, for that um, really nice introduction. Um, and I think while while he's getting the slides up, just a word about Cytoscape, I think one key decision we made at the time was to go open source back in, and this was back in you know the year 2000 or 2001. I wasn't actually originally on the side of open source. I had some idea that, that uh, okay, it'll be free to academics, but maybe there's a, you know, a, corporate potential with this thing. And, and I was talked out of it. And it was the best talking out of, I think I ever had, uh, because, because then what happened is a lot of people were, were comfortable coming in from the community. And over the years, there've been probably about a dozen different developer sites involved. Um, and at the moment, my group is still involved, but there's heavy, heavy involved in, uh, involvement from UCSF and Toronto, um, and in the past, um, European labs as well. Looks like it's almost ready. Okay, thank you very much. So today I'm gonna to talk about AI applications in cancer as well as, as data generation efforts in cancer. And you'll see how it all fits together. Jake already mentioned multimodal data uh, generation and integration, and you'll hear uh, more of that in my talk and how we're uh, essentially hastening towards, I think, a system for, for precision cancer medicine. But first, the, the premise or the, the point of departure for all of this, and uh, that is this longstanding challenge of what's known as genetic heterogeneity. Um, this is still arguably the, the big unsolved challenge, not just of, of cancer, but of essentially complex disease genomics. Uh, and as you probably know, most common diseases are absolutely complex and multigenic. In fact, far more multigenic than I think was, was ever appreciated. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk mostly about applications in precision oncology, but you might be thinking uh, of applications in other diseases as we, as we go through this. So, so what do I mean by genetic heterogeneity in cancer. People talk about within tumor heterogeneity and between uh, tumor heterogeneity. Here in this slide, I'm focusing mainly on between or patient to patient heterogeneity, but the same argument is made for looking from cell to cell or, or, or region to region within a single patient's tumor. And it's the simple fact that as you look across these, these different samples, you will find that there's a few recurrent cancer mutations that always arise or very, very often arise, I should say, not always, 
but a much, much larger number of rare uh, somatic mutations. And that principle is often shown by plots like this. This is called a long tail tumor mutation plot. Uh, this is for the cancer genome atlas colorectal cancer cohort published more than five years ago now. It had about 500 patients in it, maybe just shy of that. And what you can see is the four most frequently mutated genes across that cohort are shown APC, TP53, KRAS, PIK3CA. But then very quickly, you get into this, this rare gene mutation land where all this, of, of these mutations are observed in fewer than 10% of patients. There's the 10% mark right there. And, and essentially, all of these genes are fewer than 10 and then very quickly fewer than 5% of patients leading to the question of how we treat these thousands and thousands of genes in that long tail. And I should clarify, this is not uh, uh, at all even looking at the non-coding genome. This is just coding changes uh, 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 in, in pro, you know, which, which lead to coding changes in proteins. Um, well, that question is still a very uh, uh, open challenge in cancer genetics, but I wanna point out that at least for some of these genes, we already know that there is a, a strong role. And so pick 3 r one B2M, SMAD3, Axon1, I've just labeled four of, of the genes out here that have a lot of evidence that, that are involved uh, in, the, in the pathogenesis of colorectal cancer. And the, the key to everything I'm gonna be talking about is already shown here just by looking at the gene names. And, and what I'm gonna talk about is a potential solution to how you can deal and integrate across all of these rare, rare mutations. So you see here, pic 3 r one is the regulatory subunit of PI3K complex, uh, and pic 3 ca is the catalytic subunit, or one of them, and, and R1 is one of the regulatory subunits. SMAD, SMAD3 is but one subunit of a large transcriptional family of factors SMAD, uh, that form these SMAD complexes, and that's the one we're seeing here mutated in about 5% of patients. But uh, uh, of course, it, it goes together with many others. So the, the idea here, it, and which is not at all novel, by the way, uh, for, for uh, decades, uh, people like Bob Weinberg and others have been talking about the hallmarks of cancer, and, and that is to say the pathways that underlie pathogenesis of this disease. Um, and each where each pathway is, is uh, absolutely involving many different genes. So the question uh, isn't that, that you know, cancer is a, a pathway-based disease, it's really how to, how to identify what are those pathways, and uh, then once you have that map, which of those pathways are under mutational pressure in, in a given patient. But the idea would be that what you're really looking at here is, is not uh, a single uh, gene disease that's driving the disease, but what's really going on is there's a protein complex or signaling uh, circuit or other type pathway that's under pressure. And, and it, when, you, when you break that apart as, as just the gene boundaries, you might see that A here is a subunit is rarely mutated or D, but if you put it all together, the mutation burden on the complex or pathway as a whole can be quite, quite large. Over here on the right is, is uh, not just an illustration of that principle, it's an actual plot that we've created in the course of this type of research, and I'll get to that as we, as we go on. So now I've, I've changed the x-axis from genes to protein assemblies, or multigenic protein assemblies. And, uh, and when you look at that in colorectal cancer, same cohort, what you now see is a collection of, of nearly 100 assemblies that are mutated in 50% in or more of, of individuals. Now you still have to, uh, not all of those, it turns out are relevant to the disease. And I'll talk about how to figure that out. But nonetheless, you get the point. You, you now are no longer dealing with rare events in, in cancer. So, so first though, where is this map of cancer protein complexes and assemblies that, that might be important for understanding the cancer genome? And that itself is an enormous challenge. So, so uh, here is another slide, which I am not the first to show, but is very important for the, for the narrative here, which is that as, as you might've heard before, the human genome uh, uh, has revealed essentially a list of parts that is to say the genes and the gene products, i.e. the proteins that are encoded by that genome, but not how those, those parts fit together. And this is akin to, to taking this Mark I uh, Volkswagen Golf here and decomposing it into its component parts on the factory floor as, as, the, as the VW technicians have done. 
but then not having the assembly manual uh, shown down here in the lower left for how to put those, those parts uh, together into the final golf. So in this talk, at least the first, say, uh, uh, half or so of the talk, the goal is really how do you read out in a systematic way what that assembly manual uh, might, might look like. Well, uh, certainly we have some clues as to what that assembly manual looks like if you go into databases like Protein Data, Data Bank, PDB, and you look at the beautiful uh, 3D structures of protein complexes there, which of course are multigenic machines already. Uh, proteasome is a classic structure that degrades proteins. Uh, um, uh, it's sort of the garbage collector of the cell, as, as you may know. Here is a more recently deposited structure during the COVID epidemic, uh, SARS, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA polymerase, including the RNA template in, in, that, in that machine. So it's a protein RNA multi-component uh, machine. But uh, despite all of that productive work through structural biology deposited in PDB, we still largely uh, agree, I think, uh, that, that uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a uh, arguable topic, but, but I think many of us would agree that we've just scratched the surface. And so here's an example of, of, of a larger organeller sized machine in the cell for which there is absolutely no structure of any kind. And in fact, we don't even know what are all the proteins that go to the neuronal synapse. There are probably a thousand or more proteins that, that are part of the synapse structure. We know maybe 500 or 600 of them. And even for those, uh, for many of them, it's not clear where in that structure those proteins belong and what are their dynamics. And this type of, of, of Jetsons-like city of proteins and uh, other molecules flying around um, is, is really, uh, uh, I think, going to be the, the, uh, the uh, rule rather than exception, and I don't think that's at all controversial. So the question really is, is how do we get at in a systematic way, just like the genome project systematically read out the structure of, of the DNA, the rest of the cell biology around that DNA? Um, and so to, to start to get at this, uh, we put together a project that Jake and I are both involved in, uh, that, and the opportunity came last year in this NIH Bridge to AI initiative. Just a word about that, that initiative. Uh, it's a common fund, if you know about the funding structure of the NIH, it's a common fund project where multiple NIH institutes contributed uh, support for, for the multiple projects that were finally funded by, by this Bridge to AI uh, initiative. These were meant to be, notice, notice it's not AI, it's called Bridge to AI, and the keyword there is bridge, and the bridge is the data. <laughs> so what they want is AI-ready data sets that will then power the next generation, not just of our team, but of the whole community to build machine learning models. Um, there, are, there have been four uh, data generation or DGP projects funded. Ours was one, I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And the other, ours is a very basic cell biology structural project as we'll talk about. Uh, and, then, and then with some uh, allusions to how those, those mesoscale draft maps of human cell biology can be used in machine learning systems. The other three were, were generating uh, uh, patient phenotypic uh, uh, data from the EHR and, and like resources. Um, so I think we're also quite unique in that we're a molecular, we're the one molecular project um, that complements the other uh, three uh, uh, patient data centered projects. So here's Here's, uh, it's, it's a large collaboration of, of folks. Here's Jake down here uh, leading the teaming module. Um, I'm, I'm a lead of the tool development and optimization module. And then we have uh, uh, data acquisition standards, ethics, skills and workforce development, and so on. Um, now the, the, the data acquisition and the logic for that bridge to AI proposal came from a proof of concept developed in two earlier applications. Uh, one was called the Cancer Cell Map Initiative, and and one and, and the other funding uh, stream was called Human Futures. And here's the sort of subset of, of folks. It, it's an overlapping set of folks, I should say. Um, 
looks like I've lost in printing a PDF. The names have gotten jumbled, but not too badly. Uh, so here are six of the faculty from those earlier initiatives, uh, Nevin, Emma, and Prashant, and, and this is Andre Shali, although his name has, been, has, has disappeared. Uh, the, these four faculty were, are also involved on that last slide in the, in the Bridge to AI initiative. And here's, here's some of the earlier work I'm gonna talk about today that I think really has has shaped uh, that 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 bridge to AI initiative, uh, and and uh, most important, what I want to show are the trainees who've actually done all the work I've, I've I'll be talking about here. If this sounds like an acknowledgement slide, I assure you that it absolutely is. Uh, so uh, just in case I forget to acknowledge these folks at the end of my talk, and I'll be talking in particular um, in the first part about some some really nice work of Yue Chin. She's now a Schmidt Fellow, uh, talking about a Schmidt Futures. She's now a Schmidt Fellow at the Broad, and uh, Jin Zuma, uh, who's now a founding uh, uh, faculty member at the Beijing uh, AI Institute. Okay. And then, and then I'll mention others as, as we as we go. So here's here's what the the uh, end to end cell mapping and AI platform is meant to look like. Um, we have and and meant is maybe a conservative word. We have put all all of this into place in draft form, but I also want to make it clear that that I'll I'll certainly make no claims that we have the the end all be all. Um, uh, solution here. This is just where we are now, and um, I think we have a long way to go. Um, our cell mapping uh, platform is driven by two primary modes of what I'll call mesoscale structural data. But the key thing here, so, so we're not going to be going after in this draft 3D structural coordinates of every molecular machine we can see inside of a tumor cell. We are going to be going for an ontology of parts that we can see, okay? And then the idea being that we get full coverage of, of a cell um, using this sort of course mapping technology, and then we can come into particular components that have been discovered with X-ray crystallographic and other structural approaches. Actually, I should say a uh, cryo-EM is probably the, the uh, dominant approach here um, in terms of structural biology. But but let's talk about these course mapping techniques. So, so one is protein-protein interaction mapping by affinity purification tandem mass spectrometry. And uh, that draws these large protein uh, networks and uh, uh, in a particular cell type. And then you mirror those experiments with protein confocal microscopy, uh, or I should say immunofluorescent protein confocal microscopy. You put those two together to, to, to read out these data-driven ontologies of subcellular components and protein complexes, again, with the idea of getting full cell-wide coverage. Um, and, then, and then you put these, these ontologies into uh, as, as knowledge bases for, for uh, uh, AI systems in precision medicine for reading the disease genome towards prediction of therapeutic outcomes. And I'll talk about now for the rest of my talk, these, these, uh, these three different pieces. So first of all, um, just a word about those two input data types. On the left here, we have uh, protein immunofluorescent confocal microscopy. On the right, we have affinity purification mass spectrometry. From a high level, I like to think about these two major technologies as basically just the, a, a leading edge, not the only leading edge, but, but a leading edge of 400 years of microscopy and more than 400 years of biochemistry on the right. So what do microscopists like to do? They look at stuff in largely two dimensions under microscopes. Um, here you, you, uh, you fluoresce a particular target protein using an antibody against uh, that protein. And you all, and, and that changes from, from experiment to experiment or image to image across a, say 96 or at least 24 well plate. Um, then you counterstain uh, against a set of common landmarks that never change that then allow you to triangulate the position of that first protein as it changes. And here you're looking at count. So green is the, is the target protein, blue is staining the nucleus, and red is staining micro, uh, uh, microtubules. What's not shown here is you often have a, a cytoplasmic membrane and, some, uh, and sometimes a cytoplasm stain as well. On the right here, and, and, you know, and so each, each of those images is giving you the distribution within the cell of a given protein. Um, 
what do biochemists do? Biochemists don't like microscopes. They like to grind stuff up and pour it over columns. And that's exactly what's done here. But you still have an antibody against your target protein in, in biochemical parlance that's called the bait. And then you are uh, isolating that bait along with whatever proteins it is thought to, to proximally interact with uh, called praise. And those are identified using tandem mass spectrometry in terms of their identity. And of course, a control there is you should also re-identify the bait. And having done that, you, get, you, you draw these protein interaction networks. Now, what UHN in my group realized about third, third year into her graduate program is that these two approaches, although they had never been formally put together. Now, now, it, now, actually, I should back up and say, very often, you had a very large protein imi uh, imaging study where they used a few APMS pull downs to validate their results, or vice versa, you'd see a few images in a very large APMS study. But in terms of actual uh, front end loading of both data modalities, that had never been done. And I think one of the reasons it hadn't been done is it, it, it just wasn't clear what, what the sense in doing that would have been. You know, why would you do that? Well, what UA realized is that, in fact, these are two ways of positioning proteins. One is more global relative to the whole cell, and, and the other is very local relative to your neighboring proteins and whatever machine you're in or machines. Okay. And so, uh, combining that idea or taking that idea um, to the next level. Uh, that was a very attractive idea to someone with a machine learning background, and she has both a, you know, a biological and machine learning background, and that was, that was what she was hoping to achieve in her PhD. Uh, because when you think about uh, embedding data types using machine learning models, you're essentially positioning the, uh, whatever objects. Here, the objects are proteins, but if you're, if you're doing, say, single cell transcriptomics, the objects are cells, what have you. You're positioning, or patients, if you're, if you're analyzing the emergency medical record, you know, the, the EHR, um, electronic health record, you're positioning patients in that embedding, but here it's, here it's proteins. Um, and we simply want to position proteins in that embedding via two ways, one via images and one via uh, uh, protein networks. If the word embedding is, is, um, is foreign to you, um, I, I, should, I can say two things. One, much machine learning research has been devoted to coming up with what is a quote unquote good embedding um, meant to be a lower, a simpler or lower dimensional representation of a complex input data set. And so if you're embedding, our embedding here, it turns out has 1,024 dimensions, which sounds like a lot, but it's a, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of dimensions you would have, number of pixels, say, you would have in a confocal microscopy image or even in this APMS data set. Now, um, even if you have not uh, made embeddings or studied embeddings yourself before, if you've ever seen a talk or, or done research on single-cell RNA-seq, you, you are inundated with embeddings because every UMAP or TISNI plot you've been shown is an embedding of that, of that complex uh, uh, data set. In that case, the points, as I said, are cells, not proteins. So in our case, they're proteins, and the position of a protein relative to others indicates proximity of protein location in, in the cell distribution and proximity in, in that protein interaction uh, network. And that's verifiable, of course. You can go back for that particular cluster and check by eye that it got it right, okay? Um, moreover, because these are two structural positioning technologies for proteins, structural being the key word, I can calibrate distance through that embedding to nanometer protein distances of the object those pro that protein cluster forms. And I can do that using protein data bank. And that I think is a really unique thing we've been able to do that you can't do in say a cell embedding of single cell RNA-seq because that's more of a functional embedding this, or a cell type embedding. This is, this is absolutely a structural embedding. And then as I'll show in just a second here, um, having, having convinced yourself that that is reasonable, you can then uh, cluster the proteins in this embedding in a hierarchical way to resolve all as many subcellular components as you can, spanning, uh, spanning multiple uh, uh, size uh, uh, scales. And we'll see that in just a second. Um, now we call our, our thing the, the multi-scale integrated cell. Um, 
Uh, it is very similar to a paper that came out about six months later by, by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative people called Open Cell. Um, so just to kind of make you aware of both uh, works, they both started uh, in HEC-293 cells, so not a tumor cell type, a human embryonic kidney cell type. And the reason is simply that that's a workhorse cell line you might be familiar with. Um, and, and we already had a lot of data to get started with thinking about how you build these cell maps. Um, in our case, we collaborated with Emma, who's now, who, who is, is one of the leaders of the Human Protein Atlas for the imaging, um, as has been developed over more than a decade. And on the, the, the protein interaction side, Steve Gigi and Wade Harper and Ed Hutland at Harvard who had developed uh, this, this protein interaction map called Bioplex, or, and, and were uh, beginning to really flesh it out in HEC-293 cells. Um, however, those two projects had gone on independently up until that point. So we only had 700 proteins to work with where we had data in both modalities. So everything in this music map for our proof of concept is really just 700 proteins, okay? We are now through the Bridge to AI project uh, just about to get to 5,000 proteins, I should, I should say, um, for, a, for a different cell type. But, but I won't talk about that, to, that today. That'll be my talk next year or, or, or whenever. Um, so let's, let's get into it. So here's, so having, having come up with those embeddings for those 700 proteins, uh, or for, for uh, uh, now 5,000 proteins, you, you now look at cluster structure and, and uh, we use an algorithm called, uh, that's, that's, that's a class of what's called multi-scale community detection, where you do this clustering over multiple scales. And so you, uh, because we can calibrate here to, to nanometer sizes here, uh, if I can move this down, you can see it better. Um, we're starting at just a very small, several nanometer radius around, around uh, uh, one protein and looking at what clusters we see. And we pick up things like GIMN7, um, SNR, uh, PB2, and so on. You now raise the, uh, the, ra the, the, the radius and you pick up some more proteins. And now as you step up to about 20, 25 nanometer uh, range, look at what happens. You now merge one community with another because of course this clustering procedure at any given scale is happening all over the map simultaneously. Um, and if you look at what you've just done, you've just essentially uh, discovered a hierarchy of subunits inside of what we know and well is the pre-catalytic spliceosome. So we've simply reconstructed the spliceosome via its U1 and U2 subunits. All right, that's what's just happened. And so now in, in looking at the whole map, I am going to abstract away the individual proteins and look at just the protein complexes in the middle here in a hierarchy. And that's what's shown over here at the right. Because again, I have uh, uh, sizes for everything. I have a size ladder I can put uh, on the right and then uh, essentially lay out each component that's detected in a vertical uh, top top-down divisive manner, or you can also think about it as bottom-up agglomerative manner. You have the bigger components up here at top, like organelles, and then they factor into smaller and smaller uh, uh, compartments inside of those organelles, and finally down here at the bottom into specific protein complexes that, again, are resolvable by this, this, uh, these two data types. The, the yellow uh, uh, components are well-known. The purple ones uh, are either entirely novel or more often uh, have enough novelty in terms of the, the proteins included there that we did not feel comfortable calling them known. Um, here's just another uh, a slide on, on the calibration, which I think is important. So uh, now that we, we have each of these components, we get a predicted diameter of that component in nanometers. And now here we're taking uh, PDB and other literature for components that were not used for the calibration initially to check how well uh, music can predict that diameter. Um, and notice it's getting a, it's doing a pretty good job. This is a log log axis, by the way. It's easy to make things look linear on a log log axis, but nonetheless, um, I think the point is clear that, that that you're able to capture about four to five. Uh, orders of magnitude of scale. Of course, 10,000 nanometers is about the, the size of a human cell, depending on, on cell type. Um, and then here's, here's, for instance, that spliceosome that, that, that I showed you uh, the, the recovery of. Here's what the structure of that looks like in PDB. Uh, uh, the, the measured uh, nanometer uh, diameter of that is 42. And through bootstrapping, we can give a size range of, of our music map for each component. And we estimate its size to be between 26 and 90 uh, nanometers. Okay, so that's, 
that's the, the, the first part of, of, of my talk in terms of how we get these structures. Now, let me talk about application to disease and disease genomics. First, I have to go back and now apply this to cancer cells because everything I just showed proof of concept in was a HEC293 cell. And I also have to tell you that the imaging side of, of the cancer story is still developing and is exactly what Emma Lundberg is now, is now doing. And some of us just spent Monday um, at NIH talking about making, making more plans around and so on. Um, but what we have so far is, is um, uh, a interesting map of, of the other side of the equation, protein-protein interactions across uh, now a growing uh, cadre of tumor cell types, uh, lines and types. Uh, what we've done so far, and this is now uh, uh, with Nevin Krogan, uh, who is a mass spectrometry expert at UCSF. We have tagged uh, 61 uh, different cancer, frequently mutated cancer proteins uh, across uh, multiple cancer types. So if you think about that long tail again, we're gonna start by, by exploring the most frequently mutated proteins or genes at the beginning of that, um, and then work outwards from there. But every time you pull down a protein, you get an unbiased, or we're certainly biasing it by, the, by that bait, but then around that bait, you get an unbiased view as to what are the preys or the interacting proteins proteome-wide. And so this map isn't just re uh, restricted to 61 baits, but it, 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 it extends to nearly every protein. Um, encoded by the genome uh, by the time you're you're done. We've we've uh, and, and then I, I'll, I'll show you in a second here. we we then backstop still with uh, existing protein interaction data in the public domain, which is largely not cancer specific, but nonetheless sometimes it's important to see to to connect the dots. Um, we've we've uh, done this mapping across uh, six different tumor cell types covering uh, breast and head and neck uh, cell types. And then uh, this has in review, this actually just got accepted. Uh, we have another 22, our map of 22 uh, proteins focusing on the cancer, uh, of course, all important process to cancer, DNA damage repair, and that adds a dynamic aspect of, of DNA damage. Um, so, so here is an example uh, shown here in the middle of integrating new and existing data. PIC3CA got pulled down and identified through the blue interactions here, um, these, these interacting partners. Um, and then in the other colors are existing data from, from, from the public domain um, that show you that, 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 that those partners, in fact, um, themselves are a protein complex, which is actomyosin, okay, or at least one version of, 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 of actomyosin. And the novel complex here isn't having recapitulated actomyosin, it's the PIK3CA, an infamous cancer driver, interacts with that physically. Through uh, further functional studies with Sylvia Gutkin's lab, we can, we can show that you can drug PIK3CA um, or myosin and, and show synergy between those, those compounds. And that synergy uh, can be pushed upstream in terms of the molecular pathway um, because you also see it in, in sort of proximal downstream readouts like AKT phosphorylation. Um, but I, so, so that's that's in this paper in, in, in these papers down here. But but what I really want to focus on is is back to this issue of of mutational analysis. So what what you've also done by forming this complex is you've put together a commonly mutated cancer protein, pic 3 ca which in, in the case of, of head and neck cancer is mutated in about 18 percent of patients with more rare mutations to actomyosin proteins, but that add up. Okay, and so the total mutational uh, burden on this on this complex is about 30% of oropharyngeal cancer. Here's an example of a known complex. So that's, that last one was a novel complex with PIK3CA. Here's an example of a known complex where, of, uh, where we've simply reconstituted collagen. Okay, congrats to us. We got, <laughs> we got that one. Um, but what was not uh, well appreciated at all was the fact that collagen complexes are under intense mutational pressure in multiple tumor types. So what's collagen? Just to make sure we're on the same page, it's the dominant factor of the extracellular matrix. Collagen is formed by these triple alpha helices of three collagen subunits each, drawn from a much larger family of collagens. And then that braid then rebraids with others to form these microfibrils and fibrils, and finally the collagenous fiber. 
collagens had never uh, been observed to be under uh, significant mutational pressure because each one is rarely mutated. So this is showing the, the, the distribution of mutation frequencies across the collagen family in lung adenocarcinoma. Um, you might have thought that 21% of patients mutating collagen 11A1 would have, would have had a pulse on that radar. And it turns out, much to my surprise, when I looked at this, they did not report uh, uh, collagen A, uh, 11A1 in the lung adenocarcinoma TCGA paper. And they didn't because lung cancer has one of the largest mutation burdens of any cancer type. And so every gene gets a healthy number of mutations genome-wide, and this one simply was buried in the long tail strangely enough, okay? But, uh, but then when I, when I discovered that half of lung cancer, 49% of lung adenocarcinoma is mutating collagen, that becomes more interesting. You might be thinking, well, Trey, the bigger my umbrella, of course I'm gonna catch more patients. And so you have behind the scenes here, statistical tests, much like uh, the original cancer genome projects run at the gene level, now at the multi-gene set level to make sure that I have significant uh, mutation pressure. Um, what I what's in this paper, but I'm not showing you here is, is there's other cancer types where the mutation burden is even higher. Melanoma, more than 70% of melanoma patients are mutating collagen. Again, no one's ever found collagen mutations before, shockingly, because they never looked at the level of the assembly. Um, and then with Stephanie Fraley's lab, what we're showing here is we can create mutant matrix or and compare it to normal matrix uh, uh, for, for selected mutations found in, in, in these uh, uh, cancer cohorts and watch the behavior of cells seeded into that matrix. We thought cell migration was going to be affected. It was not. What's affected like gangbusters is cell proliferation, as you can see here with this KI67 marker um, in the mutant uh, collagen matrix. These cells are proliferating to a much higher degree than in the normal matrix. So that's two examples, but of course, uh, as I showed for the music map from, from UHN, and this, by the way, is, uh, is, is, is the work of Fan Zhang and Mark uh, Kelly uh, in my group. Uh, what, uh, of course, Fan um, uh, has, has applied similar uh, cluster and community detection approaches all over the map to get a hierarchy that we call NEST, nested systems and tumors. Fan thinks about, uh, I think you uh, started with the cell at the top. Fan started with the cell at the bottom. So the whole thing is, is rotated 180 degrees. And so now you can think about the whole uh, set of proteins in, in, in tumors is down here. And then you're factoring them into smaller and smaller components moving up the page. And then what, what his co-author Mark Kelly did is simply make, uh, oh, this was supposed to be an animation, but I realized I printed a PDF. Never mind. Um, uh, but this, this, for instance, takes one cancer type. It, it's going to run through all 12 if you let it. But uh, so uh, this just shows the particular mutation pressures in one disease, bladder cancer, on this map of protein complexes. Of course, every cancer type mutates uh, somewhere in the map, and that's why uh, the root is black and, and the large hallmarks are black. Every bladder cancer has to mutate cell cycle, okay? But how does it do it? That's what you see as you move up the hierarchy. Um, I mentioned that we had in press the cell system or the, in, in cell systems in press this, uh, the, the next map. So I'm not going to talk about it here in interest of time, but please do check out uh, this map we call a DDRAM, which stands for DNA Damage Response Assemblies Map. Um, similar idea, but now pushing a spe very specifically into, into uh, an effort to define the protein complexes in this kind of mesoscale draft way that one, one can see among DNA repair uh, proteins, including a signaling of repair. Um, what I also, uh, I'm going to use this slide to show is we, we're thinking a lot in these projects about visualization. So you can show this, 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 this map hierarchically in terms of like an ontology of parts and cells that you can resolve via those, this data. Another way to look at it, and I think there's, there's uses of both types of visualizations, is in a very, uh, uh, as, a, as a nested set of protein uh, assemblies or circles, um, uh, and that's what's shown here. So, uh, uh, for instance, here you're you're um, you're looking in in um, in this highlighted uh, region at double strand lesion repair, um, or or our our version of that through the systematic as it's been reconstructed via the systematic mapping approach. Um, there are the underlying um, uh, protein connections that formed, you know, that that complex in the underlying data. It's, and it's shown over here at left. 
um, in these nested circle packing uh, diagrams. And so there's the complex. If you were to, to, to look inside it, it's not uh, uh, simply a uniform set of proteins, but there's substructure uh, that we've labeled here, homologous recombination on the, on the left. That's this yellow cluster over here uh, versus non-homologous enjoining over here, complex on the right. And I think you that that maybe illustrates the idea well enough. And so you're you're kind of looking at this kaleidoscope of of of, of objects um, using these circle packing diagrams, which we think has some promise. But in the last 10 minutes or so of my talk, what I want to do is now talk about the last piece. Uh, of that end-to-end -end pipeline I showed at the beginning for how we think these, these, uh, these data-driven uh, maps of, of tumor and other disease cell biology can be used to interpret genetics, interpret the human genome um, with, with a view to, to clinical translatability. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll see how we get back to those maps in a second, but let me first just start fresh and let's talk about AI and ML in, in, in precision medicine. I think as Jake just, just alluded to in his talk and others will in, in their talk, I think we're here today essentially because AI has made fantastic strides in, in multiple areas of, biomedic, uh, of biomedical discovery and, and clinical application. The one I'm gonna talk about in the last few slides here is specifically predicting the response of a cancer patient to therapy given their tumor genome sequence, or at least a gene panel as is now commonly uh, measured in, in, um, and, and, and paid for by insurance. Um, so that all of these problems start to look like an input output re uh, relation for a machine learning model. And, and, my, and again, um, th there's variations on this theme of course, but in my case, um, and you know uh, the 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 input is going to be a patient a genome or or uh, most simply a list of mutated genes in that patient's tumor, and then you uh, perhaps uh, you have another input here which is what drug you're thinking of giving, and then uh, what you'd like it to do is simply say yes or no respond or non responder, right good idea bad idea that's that's one simple incarnation of precision medicine. There's been a lot of concern and talk uh, uh, these days about the so-called black box problem with, uh, with these modes of, of patient diagnosis and treatment. And, and the problem is that these machine learning models typically are trained to optimize predictive accuracy. How well do you predict a patient's response to, to a particular drug, okay? But what's, what's not at all treated in the modeling is, uh, is why, okay? What in the tumor cell or in the tumor tissue or in, or, you know, is actually causing a patient or causing me to predict as the model uh, that patient's gonna be non-responsive. And, and so th uh, this is a big problem in machine learning that, that, that's well appreciated called the lack of interpretability. And, and by the way, there's, a, there's a, a closely related problem known as lack of transferability, where, where you cannot explain, uh, you often cannot translate or transfer to a different cohort outside of uh, 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 what's been used for model training. So, so how do we deal with this problem? And there's a number of efforts out there, but, but here, the, the specific progress we've made is by using those cell maps I just spent the first 40 minutes talking about in uh, to, to structure the inner workings of deep learning models for precision medicine. And so now uh, I think, I, permit me, I've rotated the genotype phenotype equation top down, okay? Um, so there's, there's your genotype plus drug. You wanna predict in the case of tumor uh, biology simply uh, uh, how fast is the tumor gonna grow? So something akin to a, a, a proliferative phenotype in its simplest form. But now instead of, 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 of simply using an out of the box, um, uh, or I should maybe I should say in the box deep learning uh, 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 artificial neural network. I'm going to specifically assign banks of artificial neurons in there to each subcellular component that's been charted in that map. So for instance, back to the DNA repair example, maybe you'll have in there a component at a high level that's just representing DNA repair. But then as, as you factor that down into the subcomplexes, you see there's a complex related to double strand break repair, another alternative repair mechanism, basic scission repair, and so on. And all of those, each of those components has a bank of neurons assigned to represent the functional state of that component under a patient's tumor genotype or, or list of mutations, okay? 
uh, how do you train these models? We uh, start in cell lines where all the data are. Okay, it's not the most relevant data, but it's where we have the most data. There's no question. And then we we translate if we have PDX models uh, for that drug and 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 cancer type. We'll then translate to first to PDXs and then finally to to patients. Um, the, the place we usually start again is cell lines and we have between work of the Sanger Center and the Broad over the past decade, uh, a large matrix of about a thousand different tumor cell lines, each of which has been fully sequenced. So we know the mutations um, by, and each of which has been exposed to, to actually now more than about a thousand different, different compounds. So that's a million different data points if you wanna do the right the simple math there. And it's, it's actually not quite a million because you, you, you miss some combinations drop out, but nonetheless, it's a lot of training data. And, and so, so that's essential. And, and then for each of those combos, cell line cross drug, you, you, you have a, 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 a dose response curve that you try to predict and, um, and then translate to patients. And so in interest of time, because I'm, I'm, I only have an, another slide or two to uh, time's worth of, you know, of, of material here, I'm just going to go right to a result. Um, this is an unpublished result of, uh, that I'm, I'm excited to present. Um, again, I, I see there's been some, some loss in the PDF translation process. I apologize about that. But um, um, you'll get the idea here. Um, so, so we had a model uh, that we've trained to predict the response of breast cancer patients to, to, to inhibition of cell cycle kinases, uh, CDK4-6. Uh, palbociclib is one uh, that's in the, in the clinic, uh, and it's got uh, two others, ribociclib, abemociclib. Um, these are all inhibiting CDK4-6. Uh, about, uh, well, slightly over half of patients don't respond um, but nonetheless, uh, many patients do, and you'd like to tell which, which is which, of course. So we first trained this thing in cell lines, and, um, and we got a very, very high predictive accuracy, which is why I'm talking about this, this drug and, or this class of drugs and not some other class of drugs. But, you know, it, it, for about a third of the, of the drugs we've looked at, you get a pretty good predictive power. Okay, so this is not cherry picked. There was about a, we had about a third of the drugs to choose from here, but, but clearly uh, CDK4-6i is an area of, of active interest. Um, this is the true area under dose response curve of each of the cell lines. And in yellow is, is the model's prediction. So it's getting mostly right that these are all resistant tumor cell lines in, in yellow and mostly right that these are all uh, sensitive. Odds ratio of 40 is just screaming. And, and I, I said, there's just no way we're going to see an odds ratio of 40 in patients. And we don't, but you'll see it's not bad. So then we go to PDXs. I'm just going to go clockwise around the screen. Here's the PDX result. Um, we also got a uh, decent, decent result in, in PDXs. Um, here, we didn't have to generate any new mice. This is uh, you now leveraging the, this, this nice resource, the PDX Encyclopedia. And then here we leveraged Project Genie to do a retrospective clinical trial uh, uh, on, on a response to CDK46I. These aren't all palbo that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that was used here for these patients. It's a mixture of palbociclib and ribociclib. And back to the, the EHR, um, their EHR didn't actually say whether it was palbo or ribo, it just says CDK46I. Okay, I think our model might do better if I knew which was which. Just, just saying. Okay, but nonetheless, um, you can see here that that uh, four patients who get uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor plus standard of care endocrine therapy. Um, uh, here's, uh, a, and then you look at how the model um, stratifies uh, patients. It hasn't seen the outcomes, of course, the survival outcomes. But, but here's here's the in blue is the patients the model predicted would be sensitive to that, and then uh, of and then of the resistant patients, we 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 threshold it in two different ways to get a partially resistant and a fully resistant. Uh, cohort. Um, that's still a pretty good hazard ratio. And then over here on the right is the control where among patients who did not get a CDK4-6i, uh, let's still let the model stratify them into, into CDK4-6i resistant and non-resistant subgroups. And you should not see a separation because these patients haven't gotten palbo. And in fact, you don't. Okay. So now in the last slide or two, um, the more interesting thing having now convinced ourselves that the model is accurate. And by the way, there's, there's other models that, uh, that, that also get decent predictive accuracy out there, not just ours. But what we can do is open up the hood and ask the model mechanistically why. 
what are the pathways through protein components in this model or pathway uh, 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 assemblies, I should say, that are most important for integrating mutations in the genotype to predict palbociclib resistance or sensitivity. And here is that nested systems and tumors map yet again, looks a little different, but it's the same map. And in red and yellow and the colors are those most important pathways. It's good as a positive control. Here is, CD, is the CDK46 holoenzyme. That's what the actual network that was reconstructed looks like. So it's not just CDK46. There's that, that component, but it's the upstream signaling inhibitor, CDK and 2A, and then it's some downstream stuff like RB1. Um, but that's, that's the complex, quote unquote, that gets pulled out of the, the, the high throughput systematic analysis. And, and it, this thing is clearly under, under uh, 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 or I should say mutations, to this component clearly modulate your response to CDK inhib inhibitions as expected. But then what else do you find? And you see a lot of other interesting pathways, some of which are have not been well uh, appreciated. And so here's one that we're following up on now. And I should say the first thing we do for those is rather than trust the model and its explanations, you know, so things like, you know, um, AKT activating signaling, active signaling, that's actually, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of literature on that. Um, same thing with EGF, FGF uh, receptor complexes. You know, but what about PML bodies? What you know, what's what's that have to do with with uh, uh, uh response and so on and so forth? Um, and so the first thing we do is a CRISPR screen, uh, palbo times times gene knockouts or CRISPR A to to amplify genes in the case that the genetic uh, perturbation in patients is a is a copy number amplification to see whether we actually see an interaction with the drug um, when you do, uh, you know, uh, in a directed way, perturb those systems. And in fact, when you perturb those systems with Palbo, you do see uh, an increase in fitness uh, compared to, uh, of, of the cell lines, compared to uh, perturbations to control assemblies. And here's just one example of, of, a, of a transcription related complex that is quite interesting, we think, and we're following up more, more about. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, you know, I started by talking about a structural biology way to get sort of mesoscale draft maps of human cell types, uh, which uh, um, is based on protein confocal imaging plus protein affinity purification mass spectrometry. One one point I didn't make, but but needs to be made here is, you know, with, with imaging, it had long been thought that the only way to measure protein distance between a pair of proteins was to tag them both and use a, a technology like FRET to measure their, their distance or their proximity. Um, but here it turns out with, with machine learning, you don't need to do that. You simply analyze the images to embed each protein in, 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 this, in this UMAP. And then uh, what it's actually learning, just like your eye, when, when you look under a microscope and say, oh, that protein is in nuclear speckles. And you know, here's another image where that protein was in nuclear speckles. I wonder if they interact. That's what that machine learning system is doing in a linear way, protein by protein. Um, so it's not quadratic like, like FRET, where you tag pairs of, of proteins. It's linear. Um, we combine that with protein networks to build these maps of, of, of components and cells. And then um, in the last few minutes here, I talked about how those maps get used to drive uh, or, or can get used to drive these interpretable deep neural networks for, for the clinic. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions. Are we so 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 we are Hello? thank you there we go okay now we have two mics um so the question was are we reproducing the imaging data essentially was that the question
Well, so so exactly. So so um, in fact, when I you know when I talk about this project, it was a collaboration with uh, originally Human Protein Atlas, Emma Lundberg, and she's now you know no no accident. She's part of the Bridge to AI collaboration, and and that was you know our, our initial work was exactly as you suggest, based on the fact she had already run through an entire proteome worth of of of, of protein locations in in as very in a, essentially a couple different cell types. Um, and then, and then she's looking at, well, what am I going to do next? Okay, and and that's and so and so we, you know, if I get up here and I, you know, wave my arms and say we enough, what I mean is a collaboration of people. Um, now, um, and, and and the difference between that initial proof of concept and what we're doing now is is the is the images are generated as part of the project as opposed to pre-existing. Um, now, how do I re having having observed a component? Can I go back to the images um, and and regenerate them? Maybe is a question. Um, first, I should give you some detail that uh, every every uh, protein is positioned based on two to five antibodies per protein, and HPA takes a little bit of flack because it's a polyclonal and these are all polyclonal, not monoclonal antibodies. But nonetheless, from my perspective, I've got at least two shots on goal for every protein. Um, and sometimes up to four or five shots in goal. And if I see those, if I see those different antibodies largely produce the same position for that protein in the embedding, I'm more comfortable and I can actually reject an outlier if I need to. So that's one way that we, we kind of build in redundancy. Um, you, you, of course, can go back and re-image to check, and we've done that for a small number of proteins. And the other thing we can do is, is, a, is an approach that's essentially a bootstrapping or jackknifing like approach where we can leave out some fraction of images from the reconstruction and then go back and check how well we re well first of all that that's going to change that the, the the list of or the hierarchy of complexes you see and you can you can record how much it changes how sensitive that 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 hierarchical map is to to, to leaving out data. And you can also do kind of like a cross vowel thing where you use the held out data to try to recover. I, I don't know if that got to your question, but might have orbited around your question. Wonderful talk. Um, uh, my question is with all this new technology available, like spatial transcriptomics, you think, you know, integrating that, particularly with the music map, you have a few 700 protein you said, and look at different uh, cancer, different uh, mutated types, or even small perturbation, how this changes uh, using AI models and things like that. Yeah, so spatial transcriptomics are really, um, um, if you're talking about like single cell RNA-seq, really have skipped over cell biology and they're talking about tissue structure, right? So here the talk is really focused on um, not single cell, but single single molecule, or you know, uh, you know the, the 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 components within cells. Whereas when I look at a Tisney map, or a, you know, for 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 single cell transcriptomics, I've, I've skipped. You know, I, I'm talking about subtypes of cells and tissues, but I don't peer within cells. So I think this is largely what I'm talking about today, complementary to what a lot of others are doing. Um, and you could almost one day, when you look at these hierarchies, in fact, there's a beautiful paper from uh, Mark Gerstein's lab a number of years ago, where they put um, uh, subcellular structure together with, with cell type structure into one of these machine learning models, which is pretty pretty cool. So it's, it's largely complementary. Um, transcriptomics does get used in other ways, though. So can you, um, can you peer or, or can you validate the, the activity of individual protein complexes here. And we tried using their expression level at the RNA level of those complexes in response to, to you know, because you've got transcriptomics and proteomics across all these cell lines that we've trained on. So you can say, does that set of proteins, is it differentially expressed by the same patterns of genetics? I think it should be. It turns out that works far better at the protein level than it does the RNA level. And it works far better even at the protein level, when you're looking at the phosphoprotein level, then it then then just the abundance. But happy to take that offline. I don't know, Jake, if you want to. I want to make sure I don't disenfranchise someone here. I didn't get the order. Hello, thank you very much. It's great to know about all the data that's now out there. Um, on the AI side of this, on the machine learning model, 
you've described one particular way of embedding that multi-structural, multi-scale network into the machine model. How robust is that to the to the way that that multi-scale model is embedded into the machine learning model? Do you get the same results if you choose a different number of neurons or a different way of structuring that? We've so we have looked. So so one, it's a fantastic question. We need to look at it, and others need to look at it more. But we do. Um, we one thing we do. So this is not a whole answer. It's a partial answer. We 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 have scanned the number of neurons we assign per system per assembly. Right? How, how complicated is the state of the ribosome? Right? Ribosome is an object in that in that hierarchy in that ontology. Does it should it get a bank of six neurons? One. Figure more than one. Ribosome isn't just off or on. Right? But but what about six versus sixty? So we've scanned that and we try to look at where the non you know, where the knee is in the curve of performance. Performance does degrade, but we try to sort of uh, uh, look at where it plateaus. I'm not wholly satisfied with that approach. Okay, thank you. A very fantastic talk. Uh, in addition to the protein protein binding, would there be enough data to also map the what, like what RNA and DNA, those protein band, I think that can be very useful for epigenetic drug discovery. If I understand you correct, you're suggesting that we should have a protein, uh, protein DNA and protein RNA interactions in that map, and I could not agree more. I think we're probably out of time. So <laughs> yes. Thanks again. Well, uh, Trey, as always, uh, amazing science, and this is going to be so exciting when it can be put into practice. Thank you so much.